morning, church. If you are a visitor, like Ryan said, I just want to welcome you to Southern Heights. Um, This is a great church, a great church family. I'm just so happy that we can uh, just worship God together here and just to learn more about his word together. And hey, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Samuel Montoya, the Next Gen Pastor here. I'm not normally on stage, uh, just when Kyle needs a break, I'm up here. Um, So he needs a break today, and so I'm up here giving uh, the message today. But again, I just want to welcome you to Southern Heights um, and to this church family. And, And we are in a series labeled Reactions, in which we're looking at four different characters of the gospel narrative and their reaction to the empty tomb. We're looking at uh, different disciples or followers of Jesus and seeing how they react to the empty tomb and how their reactions kind of help us today and how, how we can uh, learn from their reactions today. Uh, and so before we begin, I want, I want to just begin with a thought experiment, right? Just imagine you are there that dark Saturday night. Uh, you're, you're with the disciples, you're with your friends, you're with the followers of Jesus, um, and you're wondering what happened to Jesus. And so you wake up Sunday morning, and and these women come rushing to your door, uh, probably waking you up, and they're saying, Jesus is gone. What is your reaction? You run to the tomb. You see the tomb is empty. You see the stone rolled away. What is your reaction to the empty tomb? Now, I can imagine that a lot of us might have different reactions to that empty tomb, right? There's a, a bunch of people in this room right now, and I can almost guarantee that each and every one of you are going to have a different reaction. And that kind of uh, summarizes the, the point of this message, uh, the point of the, the sermon series, right? That there's different reactions from all these different disciples, all these different followers of Jesus, and what we can learn from their reactions to the empty tomb. But it's a little bit deeper than that for me. Let me let you in a little insight to how I, I prep and prepare sermons. Uh, the, the first thing I do is I get the target uh, passage. Whether it is, whether it's a couple passages, whether it's just one long pericope, I just get the passage and I read it a couple times through. It might be three, four, five, six times through uh, before I get anything else from the outside world, before I get anything from commentaries or from, uh, for, from other ministers or from articles or from books. I try to read the Bible for what it says. In other words, as my professor used to say, I try to let the text win. So after I'm done letting the text win, after I'm done seeing what God has said, through uh, to me through the text, I then open up some commentaries, some books, and some other outside sources to see if I'm even on the right track, to see if uh, what God is saying to me is, is right or if I'm just way off and I need to kind of refocus a little bit. And so when I was uh, reading the text, when I was reading through some commentaries, there seemed about two kind of front runners for the message this morning. The first front runner was, was an albeit good uh, kind of candidate right? You, you could see it in the text. You can see this reaction uh, from our character. And it could have been easily crafted. It could have been easily uh, kind of written up and memorized and said this morning, and it would have been a good message. But I don't think it was the message that God wanted me to tell you this morning. Because there was another kind of front runner that, that was a literal dark horse for me that kind of took the lead. And I say that because it was this reaction to the empty tomb that I did not want to dive into, It was just a reaction to the empty tomb that I wanted to stay far, far away from. I even tried to run away from it, but God kept pounding on me today to say, you need to hear this. And we're going to look at this character. This character that um, is often one of my favorite characters of the Bible. Uh, But because of her reaction, it's going to hit a little different. It was hard for me to write this sermon. It was hard for me to prep because it brought up wounds and these scars that I thought were fully healed, but turns out it was just a small leak. This one's going to be difficult. And so before we begin, before we dive into any scripture, before we dive into any reactions, I just want to pray. Because I want to make sure that I'm in the right headspace. I want to make sure you guys are in the right heart space. I want to just make sure God is with us this morning. So let's go to God in prayer before we begin. God, we we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this uh, beautiful day and this beautiful body of believers. And God, we just pray that our hearts are open and receptive to hear your word that they're open and receptive to hear even the hard things that might come about throughout this message. God, we pray for all those, those pains and hurts from our past, that, that they, may heal, they may be healed through you. And God, I ultimately ask that you speak through me the gift of preaching, that I may speak your word to these, your people. Amen. And so Kyle started off our series a couple weeks ago looking at the disciple of John. And he looked at John, and he said that, Uh, John didn't want to get his hopes up, 
right? And because of the empty tomb, John and us, we can now get our hopes up because Jesus is alive. And then last week, he looked at the, another disciple named Thomas. And Thomas was also often labeled as a doubter. Uh, but we learned that it wasn't now doubt necessarily. It was his defiance of the truth that kept him from believing. And because of this defiance of the truth, we can now know uh, and have this certainty that Jesus was resurrected even without seeing. And so those are kind of the two reactions that we learned about. And we're going to learn about another reaction this morning. Like I said, one of my favorite characters of the Bible. And she often is overlooked. She often uh, doesn't get mentioned that often, but she has a very, very powerful story. And so we're going to look at the follower of Jesus, Mary Magdalene. And so Mary Magdalene, everything will change when Jesus calls her by name. Yeah. Everything will change for Mary Magdalene's story when Jesus calls her directly by name. But before we get there, we have to learn a little bit about Mary Magdalene and why she has this reaction. And her reaction is this reaction of grief. Mary, upon seeing the empty tomb, shows this grief to seeing Jesus gone. But everything will change when Jesus calls her by name. And so let's look at, at Mary's story for a second. Right? So Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 1, we, we first find uh, the mention of Mary Magdalene. And we have to first find uh, how, why Mary Magdalene is showing this much grief. Because Mary Magdalene's story starts a long time before the empty tomb. Luke 8 or, yeah, Luke 8, starting at verse 1, it says this. After this, Jesus traveled from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with Jesus and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. So the first time we see Mary, the first indication that Mary Magdalene is a character in the gospel narrative, she is uh, possessed by seven different demons. Now, one demon, that's a lot. Seven, that's crazy. And so Jesus heals Mary of this, this demon possession. He casts out uh, these demons from Mary, and her life changes. And because her life changes, she becomes fully dedicated to the mission of Christ. She becomes fully dedicated to what Jesus and his disciples are doing. And we know this based off of the later text and based off of what we see later from Mary Magdalene, that she is so dedicated. Verse 3, it says, These women, that was including Mary Magdalene, were helping to support Jesus and the disciples from town to town based off of their own means. And, and so Mary Magdalene was part of, of this, this woman uh, kind of group that, that followed Jesus around from town to town, helping him and the disciples in whatever means necessary. You see, Jesus gave Mary a second chance. Jesus gave Mary a new hope. Jesus gave Mary a new direction, a new life, a new everything because he casted out seven different demons out of her. And we don't know exactly when this happened. It could have been in Jesus' early ministry. It could have been in his late ministry. It could have been in his middle ministry. We don't really know. But all we know is that Jesus changes her life. And because Jesus changes her life, she becomes fully dedicated to everything that he says, does, and everything else. Amen. But this, this good story, this good like kind of uh, resurrection story of Mary, this, this TLC story kind of runs cold. Because we don't see anything about Mary Magdalene directly mentioned until the cross. Mary Magdalene just drops out of the picture. And this is where we see Mary Magdalene. John chapter 19, verse 25. John 19, 25 says, Near the cross stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and who? Mary Magdalene. Mary sees Jesus die. Mary sees her second chance die. Mary sees her new hope die. Mary sees her, her new life die. Her new direction, her new everything get brutally killed on that cross and not only that, not only does she see Jesus die, but the text says that she sees Nicodemus and Joseph lay Jesus' body in the tomb and roll that stone in front of it. And when that stone gets rolled in front of the tomb, it becomes permanent inside of Mary that Jesus is dead. Come on. Jesus is now gone. And because Jesus is gone, what arrives? 
her grief arrives. And I know, grief, grief is a strong word, right? When I first uh, mentioned grief, you might have brought up this memory of losing a family member or a friend or even a close coworker. Grief is this extreme kind of emptiness that comes from loss, C.S. Lewis, in his book, A Grief Observed, uh, he wrote this book after the loss of his wife. He, he defines grief as this. He says, grief is a long valley, a winding valley, and at every kind of turn, it becomes a new and totally different landscape. You see, grief hits us all differently. Grief makes us all do different things. Grief might make you angry, like really angry, and grief might make you angry with others, might make you angry with the world. Oftentimes, grief makes you angry with God. And we have this like pent-up anger inside of us that, that we try to keep hidden for a while, but when we experience this extreme feeling of loss, it just gets pushed out for all the world to see. But you might not experience grief in terms of anger. You might experience grief in terms of emptiness or hollowness or kind of numbness. You might not have any motivation, this, this lack of motivation to do simple things like get out of bed or brush your teeth or, or comb your hair or shave or even make breakfast. You feel this emptiness, this lack of motivation to do anything because you've experienced such great loss. You've become handicapped in your pain. You've become handicapped in your anguish and your sorrow. But some of you don't feel that way at all. Some of you don't feel anger. Some of you don't feel numbness. Some of you just feel fine for a while. Some of you feel fine for a while. You live your days just like you've done before until you smell that smell, until you drive down that one street, until that Facebook memory pops up on your feed, and then you lose it. You absolutely lose it because you've been keeping it fine for a while, but there's this anguish that's just been building and building and building because you couldn't, until you couldn't contain it anymore. Everyone experiences grief differently. And through our reaction series, we can see that grief hit our disciples differently as well. You see, John experienced grief. John experiences this, this uh, reaction of grief in the form of hopelessness. John experienced what psychologists now have coined the temporarily unable to see the rainbows. John couldn't see color in his life anymore. John couldn't see hope or light in his life anymore. And Thomas experienced something differently. Thomas experienced grief in the, in the form of running away, in the form of fear. He, he ran away from his problems in defiance of the truth. He wanted to grieve alone without the company of others. You see, grief hits us all differently. But sometimes uh, grief is, is more than just a reaction. Sometimes grief hits us more than just a singular event. Sometimes grief makes us do these, these things, makes us say things, makes us see things that are out of our normal character. Grief sometimes makes us do these out-of-character actions that, that we probably would have never even thought of. And some of these out-of-character actions are often proofs and claims as to why Jesus never actually resurrected. Sometimes uh, these people take these, these out-of-character actions and put these on the disciples to say Jesus never rose from the grave. And one of those theories is the hallucination theory. The hallucination theory states that the disciples and the 500 plus people who saw Jesus' resurrected body multiple times on multiple occasions and multiple events were all just imagining him. That it was all just one big hallucination. That, that they were just making it up. That he was just some imaginary friend that they thought of. Now, I'll be honest with you. In our grief, sometimes we can hallucinate. In our grief, sometimes there are cases in which people have hallucinated the loss of a family member, friend, or coworker. But in every single one of those cases, in every single time, it has been a singular hallucination. It has been one person, one time. It's never been a mass hallucination. Because hallucinations are personal phenomena. So if these people are saying that 12 people plus 500 plus people saw Jesus at multiple occasions, at multiple locations, the same hallucination multiple times, well, joke's on them because that's almost a bigger miracle than the resurrection. <laughs> but then there's another theory. It's simply called the conspiracy theory. And this theory states that the disciples late Saturday night, early Sunday morning, uh, they snuck up to the tomb. 
And after sneaking up to the tomb, they paid off the Roman guards to kind of move out the way. And mind you, the Roman guards were guarding the tomb with their lives. Like if the Roman guards, if anything happened to the tomb, these Roman guards uh, would probably be crucified themselves. If anything happened to Jesus, these Roman guards would be crucified themselves. And so these, these, this theory states the disciples snuck up to them. They paid them off with who knows what amount of money. It probably would have been an enormous amount of money. They, they, they moved that stone out from the tomb. They grabbed Jesus' dead body, and here's the kicker. They go on a weekend at Bernie's tour around Jerusalem and say Jesus is alive. <laughs> but here's the best part. Because they fake this resurrection, they get brutally killed in the coming years. And if that sounds crazy to you, if that sounds just out of whack, because it is, that never actually happened. But what does happen Grief does make us do crazy things. Grief does make us do these out-of-character things. It makes us do these out-of-character sayings and makes us see these out-of-character things. Grief sometimes blinds us from the truth. Grief sometimes uh, uh, makes it hard to reason. Grief sometimes put this, like, puts this blinder in front of us that we can't see what's right in front of us. And that's what's going to happen to Mary. Mary is going to be blinded by Grief. So let's turn there. John chapter 20. John chapter 20 is where we see uh, the reaction of Mary, um, where we first see Mary coming to the tomb. John chapter 20, starting in verse 1, says this. It says, early on the first week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. And so Mary came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have put him. You see, we know from other gospels, from other kind of scenes, that that Mary wasn't the only one going to the tomb that morning. There were other women, but John does not include them, like Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. John does not include those other women. John doesn't even include the sprinkled angel sightings that Matthew, Mark, and Luke do as well. No, all the attention is on Mary. And when John gives all the attention to one or two characters, you best listen, because something important is going to happen. And so what we're going to do is we're going to focus solely on Mary Magdalene. And what does Mary Magdalene do? Well, before she does anything, uh, she is just overcome with this sadness, with this pain, with this anguish, with this grief. Not only emotionally seeing Jesus die on that cross, living all day Saturday knowing that Jesus wasn't coming back, but spiritually she was in a dark place. She saw this Messiah, this Christ, cast out demons from her, but she also saw this Messiah die. And so not only is she emotionally in darkness, she's spiritually in darkness, and now John states that she's physically in darkness. Verse 1 again says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark. John didn't have to include that, but he does for a reason. Because Mary's life right now is, is just overcome with grief. And so when Mary comes up to this tomb, she probably didn't want to be there. She probably didn't want to see Jesus' dead body again, but, but ritualistically, she had to go. Ritualistically, she, she had to see Jesus' dead body so she could put spices and herbs on him to, to make him a little bit fresher. And so when she gets up to this tomb, she sees that the stone is rolled away. Her immediate thought is something is wrong. Something is wrong with this picture because Jesus was here and now he's not, and that doesn't make any sense to me. I know I'm in this weird state of grief, but that still doesn't make sense. And so she goes to the only people in this current moment that she knew could provide her some comfort. She runs to Peter and she runs to John. And when she gets to the disciples' house to tell Peter and John what had happened to Jesus, John doesn't mention here that they give her any uh, condolences. He doesn't mention that they give her a hug or or tell her that everything is going to be all right, that maybe she's acting just a little crazy. No, John just brushes over it and says, we ran to the tomb. And Mary is left again in this state of grief all alone. So the next time we see Mary, after John kind of emphasizes him and Peter a little bit, we see Mary back at the tomb. And you have to think, This side of the tomb, that would be a cause of celebration for us. 
Looking back at it now, if we saw the empty tomb, we'd be like, guys, Jesus is alive. He's resurrected. He's out of the tomb. Be praiseful for that. But for Mary, you have to understand, she just saw him die. She just saw her second chance die, her new hope die. She just lived a full day in sadness. You see, the empty tomb wasn't a cause of celebration for her. It was a cause of her grief. Because not only was Jesus gone one time for dying, Jesus was gone a second time for disappearing. So Mary was in this state of grief all alone. We see her at the empty tomb, and this is what happens. John chapter 20, verse 11, we see Mary again, this time all alone. It says, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken the Lord away from me, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. And we know that she's alone based off of the eyes. I don't know. I don't know where he put him. Mary is all alone looking into the tomb, and she sees these two angels. And so as the the kind of focus shifts back onto Mary, we see this unique interaction that she has with those angels. But you have to understand that in John's gospel... John makes a highlight and a note to point out where exactly Jesus is at seemingly all times. Whether it's a destination, whether it's a place, whether it's a town, whether it's a time of day, whether it's dark or light outside, Jesus is always mentioned in an exact location. In the exact location of where Jesus' body was, the last place we knew where Jesus' body was, was where? In that tomb. And here we see that Mary doesn't know that. Mary doesn't know what had happened. Mary doesn't know what's been going on behind the scenes. And so when the angels ask her, why are you crying? She just simply says, I don't know. Someone please tell me where Jesus is. If you tell me, I'll go get him. I'll carry the the 200 pound man by myself back to this tomb because I just want to find him. Please find Jesus. What John also does is he glazes over the fact that, that Mary Magdalene is standing in the presence of two angels of God, seated in the exact position where Jesus' dead body used to lay. And this glossing over, this, this glazing over, this kind of uh, nonchalant uh, way of introducing the angels into Mary Magdalene's story shows us this incredible state of grief that Mary has put herself in, that, that Mary is in because she cannot yet see that two angels are sitting in front of her exactly where Jesus used to lay. You see, two times, as John mentioned, that Mary is either crying or weeping. And then again, a third time, the angel asked her, woman, why are you crying? Only emphasizing the amount of grief that Mary is in. Poor Mary. She, she's, she's been through a lot. She's, she's seen her best friend die. She's come to the tomb when she might have not wanted to, and she sees the tomb rolled away, and Jesus is gone. But this now throne of of grace where these two angels are sitting is only a cause of more grief in Mary. She is so blinded by her pain, so blinded by her sorrow, that that the narration serves us no depiction of her reaction to such angelic beings, but rather this overwhelming state of grief in Mary in the front of grace. And church, let me tell you, grief, grief is distant from grace. And we know that because of Mary's reaction to the angels here in the story. Because she is so concerned about the location of Jesus that she can't quite yet see that that grace has taken his place. That these angels seated one at the foot and one at the head in this position that we call the throne of grace have taken Jesus' dead body's place. That this tomb, this empty tomb that used to symbolize death now symbolizes life. But Mary cannot see that because she is in grief. She's blinded by her pain. She can't quite yet see that her life was about to change. And it is about to change. Literally, as she turns around, and spiritually, as her life gets turned upside down. Back to John 20, starting in verse 14. It says, At this, Mary Magdalene turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. So Mary's contention of grief, the answer to all her problems, the answer to uh, this hopelessness, 
is standing right in front of her. It was before with the throne of grace. Now physically, Jesus himself, the resurrected Jesus, is standing in front of Mary, and she cannot see it. She still cannot see grace because of her grief is so strong. She does not realize that it's Jesus. And so Jesus will ask her. He says in verse 15, Woman, why are you crying? Yet another mention to the state of grief that Mary is in. This is the fourth mention of her crying. Jesus says, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Mary, thinking it was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And so John tells us why Mary did not recognize that it was Jesus. John tells us that uh, Mary thinks that Jesus is just the gardener. He doesn't have to include it, but I think it's beautiful uh, that, that Jesus, this, this resurrected king, this now fully son of God, is in his garden again, walking with his people. But that's a sermon for a different day. Mary Magdalene sees uh, Jesus and recognizes him as the gardener. And not only that, because of her state of grief, she does something that's, that's often overlooked. Because she blames the person that she's looking for in stealing him. She practically says, hey, Jesus, if you know where Jesus' dead body was, can you please tell me so I can get him back for you? She is talking to the very person she is looking for, and yet she cannot see it because in she, she is in such a state of grief. It was late August of 2017. I was the student activities, student activities coordinator at the time uh, at Central, and, and part of my job was to welcome in new freshmen as they came into school. It was my job to make them feel loved, to make them feel welcome, to make them feel at home, make them comfortable with the fact that they're going to school for the first time because 90% of them were homeschooled. Um, <laughs> see what I mean? So I had to kind of coax them in the right direction a lot of time. Um, but there was this girl, and this girl was different. She, she knew what she wanted. She dressed the way she wanted. She was strong-willed. She was strong in every aspect of the word. And I didn't have to coax her to do anything. In fact, she probably coaxed me to do some stuff that I wasn't proud of. It was refreshing to see such a, a, a strong-willed uh, person coming into their freshman year. And we became close friends. So close that she uh, was one of the only people that called me Samuel. Everyone else called me Sam. She was the only person that called me Samuel. And she started dating one of my other good friends, a guy friend, and uh, they, they instantly hit it off. Right? They, they were perfect for each other. They're a match made in heaven, so to speak. And they did everything together. He was there when, when she had some problems. She was there when, when his dad passed away unexpectedly. And when I finally met Allie the following uh, January in 2018, they became really good friends. They became inseparable. They became shatterproof. And we did everything together. Uh, us four went on double dates together. We saw movies together. We'd laugh about the, how stupid the plots were. We'd do homework together because me and him were in some of the same classes, and, and Allie and her were in some of the same classes as well. So, so we'd do homework together in the student center. Uh, we, we'd go on these fun adventures together. We were there for them whenever they needed. They were there here for us whenever we needed it. He confided in me about what the best uh, possible way to, to propose to her was because we both knew that if he messed up, it would be game over for him. And he confided in Allie um, about what the best ring was for him to pick out for her. We were both there for each other through thick and through thin. We were there for her through anything. We were there when she came running in, telling us the good news that she had been engaged. She was there when she came running in with this kind of uh, anxiousness about cutting all her hair off. And we said, no, you look beautiful. We were always there for her. Until she wasn't. You see, January, January 21st, 2019, I was picking up Allie in uh, Clever, and we're making our way through Jeff City. And we get a text on my phone. Something terrible has happened to her. 
As I pull off, me and my friend are in the front seat. Allie's asleep in the back seat. We pull off. We're trying to debate whether or not to tell her. What, what do we do? What do we say? What, like, what do you do in this situation? And Allie wakes up, and I have to tell her the hardest sentence I've ever had to take. I said, Pate? Or as I called her, Peyton? Peyton was gone. She had been in terrible car accident, black eyes, slipped off the road. She was gone. And that drive home was silent. It was empty. We, we got back to this. We got back to the school. Allie went to the dorm with the girls and mourned. And I went to mine, and I broke down. I cried for the first time in almost 10 years. My, my, my pillowcase, my, my jacket was soaked in tears and snot, and it was not a good picture. I was angry, like really angry, angry with God. Why he could take a 19-year-old away three months from her wedding day with a life in front of her? Why would you take this girl away? And no amount of questions I asked professors or students or anyone I could talk to, no amount of questions ever answered the state of my grief. No one could answer it. And I can understand what, what Mary is going through in this moment, losing her friend. And no one is there to help her. She runs to, Mary, to Peter and to John, and, and no one gives any answers. She, she finds the empty tomb, and two random dudes are in this empty tomb where Jesus used to lay, and they don't tell her anything. She turns around and sees this gardener, and he doesn't say anything. Mary is just in this grief all alone. Everything will change when Jesus calls her by name. Verse 15. 16, rather. Jesus says to her, Mary. And Mary turns around, cries out to him in Aramaic, Rabbani. Verse 18. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the good news. I have seen the Lord. She goes from saying, I don't know where they have put him. And once Jesus says her name, she says, I have seen him face to face. Everything changes when Jesus calls her by name. There is no more grief in Mary. There is no more sorrow. There is no more pain. Revelation 21.4 says this, Jesus will wipe every tear from your eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order has passed away. Grief was not in that tomb anymore because Jesus had risen. Sorrow was not in that tomb anymore because Jesus had risen. Pain was not there for he had risen. Anguish was not there for he had risen. Hurt was not there because he had risen. Everything changed when Jesus calls Mary by name. And everything changes for you when Jesus will call you by name. You see, for Mary, she went from this grief-filled a lonely, sorrowful woman, and as soon as Jesus called her name, she was overjoyed with grace because she had seen the face of God. I can find some peace and some solace knowing that they is life with it in heaven with Jesus. And that when she entered those pearly gates, Jesus called out, Peyton, welcome home. My grief was sealed in that tomb, but grace rolled it away. My pain was sealed in that tomb, but grace rolled it away. S Sorrow was rolled in that tomb. A grace rolled it away. Everything changes when Jesus calls you out by name. And I know it's hard. I know it doesn't make sense. I know it's confusing. But trust me, Jesus is alive. And that's why I keep going. 
And so if you're struggling with, with grief or with pain or with sorrow or with, with any kind of loss, I encourage you to come up to the front as we sing. Let us pray for you. Let us talk with you about that hurt. Because one day we will see Jesus in his garden again, and he will call you by name. Isaiah 43 verse 1 says, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by what? By name, and you are mine. We will enter that garden again with Jesus, and he will call us out. He will say, Brian and Mark and Kyler and Kyle and Allie and Carter and Jonas and Jess and Anna and and Zach. He will call us by name into his heaven. Everything will change when he calls you by name. Let's sing together.